So tonight we're going to be joined by Faye Ellingson. She's going to be talking about uh, about uh, film development processes and packaging processes, and he's going to make sure that we all sort of go home understanding exactly what those terms mean in in Hollywood. Ray, I mean, uh, did, did you well, always know? Or <laughs> no, no, it was it was really an accident. It uh, I the first partner who helped me found this company. He and I were filmmakers years ago, and we were out hawking our wares like most people are trying to get their script uh, produced. And we decided to go to uh, institutional financing, and we went to Pacific Mercantile Bank, and we said, hey, we've got this great script. And they sort of looked at us funny and said, great, well, what would you like? And we said, well, we'd like funding. We really had no idea what we were doing. And uh, they said, great, well, uh, let's see some analytics on that. And we went, oh, what? okay, sure. And then we went back home and asked a bunch of people what analytics were, went to a company called Film Profit, and put together some analytics and came back. And they looked at it and went, great, where's your schedule and your budget? We went, oh, uh, great. So we went back and put all that together and came back. And they said, great, who's your producer's rep? And about that time, we were like, oh, for God's sake. Um, <laughs> and it really was a frustrating experience. It took us about a year and a half. We did finally get that film funded. I uh, did go to market. It was a project called Now You Know uh, with Kevin Smith, and it was Rashida Jones, and it was extremely successful. But the sort of birthing of that project was so frustrating that at one point my partner and I looked at each other and were like, never again. So we started talking to people who had actually produced a lot of films, and everybody sort of had this uh, thing that they called development. And over time, we've refined that process of development so that we can answer all the questions that any potential financier might ask you so that you can meet the requirements for funding. Mm. Very cool. Can you tell me um can you tell me sort of what I think you've reviewed some of the processes you've outlined, but for example, um you talked about film analytics and can you what exactly does that involve? How what does film profit do specifically when it comes to you give them a script, do you give them a budget, do you give them a potential cast or what information do you provide that helps them figure out the analytics and what do, what do the analytics actually review? Uh well actually uh, there's a there's a few companies out there. There's Baseline, there's Film Profit, there's Kagan and Associates, although that's more geared toward television. And an analytics firm is a third party independent company. Uh, you know, some of Film Profit's clients include like Sony Pictures and you know, so they're they cater to the industry at large. Uh, what they provide is things like comparisons and trends, market analysis, projections, things that you need for your particular project to uh, have a good sort of footprint or idea of what you're looking at as far as the marketability, is there a market, what's your demographic. So these things are all compiled by these analytics firms. Uh, what they require to get involved in baseline and film profit are a little different. For film profit, they require at least a uh, coverage or a thorough synopsis, not just a one-liner or a log line. But uh, they want to know basically what the project is, what the genre is, what type of talent you're looking at. They'd like to know sort of a proposed budget uh, as close as you can get it because your analytics will actually determine what your budget is. Uh, you may go, oh, I've got a $10 million film, and film profit may come back and go, well, sure, that means you only lose $8 million now. Um, so, <laughs> and, and that's on... <laughs> We laugh, but that's actually happened to people, unfortunately. So it helps to have a basic idea of what you're looking at, and as much information as you can give an analytics firm, that's always helpful. As little as you have, then what they usually do, Baseline and Film Profit will send out a questionnaire, and they're very thorough about what they need as far as just sort of data so that they can move forward. That's very interesting. So when you talk about putting together um, – uh, a budget. I mean, I, I, I think most filmmakers sort of seem to be able, oddly, to answer the question off the top of their head. Well, you know, this is like a three million dollar project. This is a ten million dollar project. This is a thirty million dollar project. So, what do you mean by a budget? I mean, how anybody can make up a number, right? Well, sure. It, um, a gentleman named Lloyd Kaufman, who runs a pic, uh, company called Troma Films, once told me years and years ago. He said, "A budget's going to be what it's going to be, not what you want it to be." And, you know, that sort of logic went way over my head at the time. But he's right in a sense. You know, you can say, oh, I've got a $2 million film or I've got a $5 million film. You don't know what you have until you do a schedule or a day-out-of-days breakdown of the script, which takes every single scene, 
breaks it down into, you know, its, its components of location, time, equipment, cast, crew, everything that you need. And that becomes what's referred to as a burn rate. In other words, you do a day out of day as a schedule. It's a 30-day or 40-day schedule based on all the elements that you put together or all the requirements of the script. And each day becomes a burn rate of money. And you take that day out of days, and then you compile a budget of what each day costs you. So you can make it cheaper, certainly. You don't have a list cast. You have the guy next door who went to an acting class once um, instead of Brad Pitt. Um, you have other elements in play that you wanted to shoot on an Alexa, and you wind up shooting on the camcorder that your friend loaned you. Um, so those are there's a lot of variances in your budget. And what you want is all the tools necessary to tell your story, obviously. But those budgets fluctuate greatly depending on what the requirements of each project are. So when you talk about creating a budget, does it matter um, who creates the budget? Like, let's say, for example, like I have a, a deep, you know, I I have a DP, you know, and he's been involved in a lot of films, and so he comes up with a budget, and you know, um, he 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 looks on the SAG site and he figures he looks at what you know the the date, you know, what the rates are for a week or whatever, and so does it, the budget have to be? I mean, there's accuracy, I guess, but is are there any other factors? that involve who actually makes the budget? Can it be just anybody who does the numbers, or does it have to be a specific person? Like any well, particular you know, qualifications? Again, you can use you know any tool for a job, whether it's the right tool for the job, is an entirely different story. Um, I prefer to use an experienced UPM, or unit production manager, mm -hmm. uh, or a line producer, and an AD, or an assistant director, for both of those equations. One is the schedule, or the day out of days, which I usually have a you know, an experienced AD assistant director put together for me. That's handed over to a UPM or unit production manager so that they can break all that down and actually do your day out of day, you know, based on the day out of days, do your actual cost per day and your budget overall. Can anybody do a budget? Sure, you can figure it out. There's tons of books. There's a mm -hmm. lot of literature. There's a lot of information on the Internet of how do you put together a budget. But unless you have the experience, unless you, you know, and, and a budget's very complicated. Uh, when I'm piecing together a budget, I'm calling anywhere from 30 to 60 different vendors. That's everything from camera houses to post-production, uh, catering companies, uh, insurance companies. You want to get an actual rate and quote of what that's going to cost you, not just so an estimate. So you, you just mentioned kind of an interesting thing, like um, the insurance thing. So there's kind of several different kinds of insurance as well, right? There's the sure. there's the workers' comp insurance, and then there's the insurance for the 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 insurance for the production being bonded and so forth. So not really not every budget is okay, right? I mean that's kind of the correct. One there's of the several yeah, there is several types of insurance as you just pointed out. There's production insurance. There is workman's comp, which is an employee uh, insurances. There's a completion bond, which is an, you know, an insurance bond to cover the expenses of, of the picture. If you go over budget and you have a completion bond, then they're obligated to come in and make sure you come in on time on budget to protect the investors. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of different types of insurance. You have to be very familiar with each policy. You have to be very familiar with what is required uh, from a liability standpoint. So I would just suggest that anybody puts together a budget. And it's worth spending the money to have a UPM and an AD. And a lot of people go, well, I can get a budget for $1,000. All right. Um, that may not pass muster at Film Finances or ProSite, the completion bond companies, but you can certainly put it together. So that is, and that kind of actually brings up the, the next topic. So all of those things are required just to get just to put together the budget so that you know how much money that you're going to – the production budget. And that may not be the only budget that you need for funding. You may also need to – you know, depending on how you plan to do distribution. So you, you, need, a, you need a full budget as part of your – so when you do development, you need a full – the day of days – the full budget, and then you were men you mentioned something about cash, and I, people, God, that's like the thing everybody talks about, and is is uh, when they talk about packaging, they say, uh, well, I need to attach, you need to attach a star, you need to attach somebody, but how do you attach people before you have funding? I mean, does like is that part that of the is, development process? That is, yeah, that's the age old chicken and egg question that every independent filmmaker is run up against, and I'm sure anybody listening right now is probably rolling their eyes because they've had a similar experience with, hey, great, get us this cast attached, and we'll go ahead and you know fund your movie. Well, 
I have my cast attached, and I don't need you to fund my movie. I can go to a bank. Um, so there is a chicken and egg issue. And, you know, everybody says, oh, I need casting. I need – my experience has been eventually you'll need casting. But there's a lot of other things that even institutionalized financing, any smart private equity funding group, they're going to be looking at more things than just your cast. Cast is simply, um, from a perspective of finance, cast is simply a collateralized instrument. In other words, some type of surety or insurance that there's going to be a market for your picture. Uh, it doesn't, you don't necessarily need to have cast attached uh, to get the money and vice versa. Um, I think in the many films that we've put together, we've put together a full development package. We've brought it to, uh, you know, first we have to get development funding, which is a whole separate conversation, but then once we get that and we're into capital funding or trying to approach capital funding, we will go to people and they'll say, well, do you have cast attached? Well, no, but we've hired a casting director. We have the cast avails. We have their quotes, and we have everything we need to go make an offer. Um, this is sort of getting complicated, but to sort of shorten this conversation for purposes of answering your question, cast is important, but distribution is probably your key. That is the key linchpin factor to getting funded. Right. And you mentioned, I think you mentioned the fact, so I just want to sort of review the people that you have as part of the team that does development, because that's really the issue when it comes to doing the development. So you mentioned that first you have you have the script, because apparently you need to have the, the script, then you need to have um, the day of the the uh, persons the, the the team the producer and the first AD the, to do the day sure. of days and the and the budget and then you need, you mentioned having a casting director um, because you need to be able to get avails and that's when you call up you call up the people that you think you want to have based upon the casting director's consultation and and what you think and what the film needs and based on what film analytics says your budget can be so you get the casting director is the one that actually figures out and makes the phone calls and finds out is would this guy be available to shoot in this time period right correct and correct. then and then at that point you're saying that you you start think at that point you start looking around to get um distribution so how how does that actually happen when you don't even have a finished film and you're not funded correct that's that's a good question um Generally, and you know what I might do if we have time in this conversation, I might just sort of go over what I refer to as the laundry list of mm -hmm. things that you need to meet the requirements for capital funding. I'll, I'll readdress that later, but okay. to answer your question directly here, um, how do you get distribution? How do you get all these elements? How do you get a casting director? Those things are if you have development funding, and you know that's a critical phase of any kind of or, or any film venture that you're putting together. Um, but if you're going into development, you're going to require some funding to get these elements in place. In other words, to hire your AD for the schedule, to hire your UPM, to have your analytics put together. Barring that, and we'll address that separately, um, getting distribution is in development, you hire a producer's representative. Uh, they're commonly referred to as a producer's rep. A lot of people ask me, well, you mean a sales agent? And it's not a sales agent. Uh, I can tell you in 20 years I've had really horrible experiences with sales agents, and I apologize to anybody who's listening that happens to be a sales agent. Um, but uh, I've had really great experiences with producer's reps. The difference is a sales agent, when you're done with your picture, that means you've had to get casting, funding, all those things prior when you have your picture done, you can go to a sales agent. They will charge you a pretty hefty upfront fee, and they'll go out and hit markets for you. They'll sell the foreign territories. They'll get you these markets. Sometimes they'll come in a little earlier when you're in the finance end of it if they smell money, and they'll come in and help you get some distribution based on them getting a fee. Um, they don't strategize as far as maximizing the exploitation of your picture. They're concerned with their direct contacts, and their exploitation and getting their fees for selling the territories that they have connections to. By contrast, a producer's representative is hired by the producers, just what it sounds like, representing the producers, and their sole job is to get your film, or you as a producer, to get your project worldwide distribution in any and all media. So if they come on in development, you pay them a small fee against what they'll get out of the production budget, against what they'll get in back end in a shared first position with the producers. And a reputable producer's rep will 
not gouge you up front. They need some fees up front because they're traveling markets. They're pushing your project to distributors. But they represent you, and their job is to strategically find a way to get your project into the world market and exploit it to its maximum potential. So they'll do something like tier stage releasing where they'll cut a deal with a broadcaster, but they won't deliver it till the fourth quarter, so they have the first three quarters to exploit that in other media. That's very cool. So, so the producer's rep is the one that actually reaches out to distributors. And so when they reach a distributor, how does, it, how does having distribution, how does having a distribution agreement matter? I mean, what is that, how does that translate into funding? Is it, does it just assure how do you the... How monetize that? Sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, if you, there's something that's referred to as minimum sales guarantees, and people used to refer to them as pre-sales, but I haven't seen a pre-sale in five years. Um, but minimum sales guarantees in either the foreign market or the world market, they're basically a letter from a distributor saying that, hey, if you deliver this film with A, B, C, D, and E, in other words, you meet the deliverables requirements as well as the talent requirements that we agreed to. In other words, you talk to the distributor before and they'd say, hey, if you get me talent that's based on this sort of value or Q value in the market, it could be James McAvoy, it could be Jeremy Renner, or on a lower budget, it could be a TV actor that has a familiar face. But as long as you meet those requirements of that level of talent, as long as you meet their other requirements, they will put together an executable distribution sales agreement that states that upon delivery, they will guarantee in the foreign markets you know, uh, within that agreement, they will guarantee X number of dollars in that marketplace within X period of time, which is usually 18 months delivery. Hmm. And you can take that, and that's actually a collateralized instrument that you can take to an institutionalized financing group like Pacific Mercantile, First Republic, Bank of America now has an entertainment division, and you can utilize those or bank the paper with those agreements and get a loan against that collateralized value. Very cool. Cool. So, so you get um, you have you have the budget, you have the you have the cast details worked out, you've got the. You create, you've created what amounts to it. It's a package, right? It's a package of all of this information, um, and it, it is. this and this is it, that's what it means. Package. That's why they call it packaging. It's because you're gathering up all of these things, you're putting them into a package, and this is what you actually take to. This is what you take to um, different funders. Is that correct? Correct. And you know, there's a, people sort of have their own euphemistic idea of what developing and packaging is. You know, and it, it is different things to different people. For our company, particularly, it is, as I mentioned earlier, creating a laundry list of things that you have to have completed in order to meet the requirements for funding. And those are some of the things that we've been pointing out over this conversation. Cool. So the, I, I want to talk about a couple, uh, a couple of other things. So part of your funding, the funding that you collect, you're going to get some of your funding – um, from the bank by by getting loans for based on the minimum sale a minimum sales guarantee, then you're also probably going to shoot in a state and, and some states offer significant rebates or other like even countries like there's people that, that if you shoot in Ireland for example they get a, they get like a huge rebate 25 uh, 25 percent or something crazy percent, if you've got yeah. a co-production with a, somebody who lives who is an Irish filmmaker. So, but so you get you gather up those monies as well, correct? You gather up so, and I think you've worked with, if I'm not mistaken, you've worked with the state governments of um, New Mexico and uh, other state governments. Mexico, Georgia, Arizona, um, Louisiana. I'm sure I'm missing a few. I've dealt with Toronto's provincial tax credits. Um, I just recently dealt with a uh, Romanian tax credit program. So, hmm. uh, yeah, there's, and maybe I can, maybe I can. Uh, create sort of a bridge version of this. The types of funding that you're going to be looking for, and there's four basic types of capital funding or production funding. There's, institu if I may point those mm -hmm. out real quick. Uh, there's institutionalized financing, which is, as I've mentioned several times in this conversation, uh, entertainment banks, and there's a whole list of them. Uh, there is, I've only mentioned the ones that I've had direct dealings with. Uh, there is the second type of financing, is debt equity financing. Now that can be through a bank, but it's and and institutionalized financing does require collateralized instruments. But debt equity, or you know, this sort of model is bringing in these uh, minimum sales guarantees, as I mentioned before, are having some collateralized instrument to utilize. 
Uh, the third is private equity. And each one of these has their own requirements, but they all sort of require the same development that we've been discussing tonight. Um, private equity is there's like a, Wells Fargo has a really uh, well-developed private equity fund. It's high net individuals that have this equity fund they put together. And it used to be what was referred to as hedge funds. Mm -hmm. But now these private equity funds are out there, and they will fund entertainment. Um, they'll do 50%. They'll do 70%. Hmm. Some have 100% models. Um, then the fourth type is this sort of weird hybrid that is also a collateralized instrument, but they utilize talent. William Morris Endeavor has put together hmm. with Lotus Entertainment, with Relativity Media. They've put together this model whereby they'll go out and secure the talent and package the talent. Uh, the production company will put up the money for the talent, not just a pair play, but their full offer of their value. So if you have a $10 million film and your top two stars are going to be $4 million of that, then they will secure $4 million against those bankable talent names. And then the rest of the funding, that's a collateralized instrument again, and the rest of the funding is then funded through this uh, joint venture between the talent agency and the production company. Um, mm -hmm. And those, are, those deals are happening all over the place right now. Uh, a film that's coming out right now with Tom Hanks called Hologram for a King was mm -hmm. funded under this model. So there's a lot of films out there, and there's a lot of independent films being funded under this model as well. Um, so those are the types of funding that you'll have access to as an independent filmmaker. That's very cool. And so, and it, so you mentioned your laundry list, and I think you know you sort of gone over several things on your laundry list. But if you wanted to review, and the other one, I think one interesting thing that I haven't heard us talk about yet, which I think is an important part of packaging and, de and development. I think you've mentioned to me in the past is the legal aspects. Like you need, like you need a corporation, and you know you have to decide if it's going to be a single sure. purpose thing or it's going to do a slate. And then you have there's like, and you need to have lawyers because you have. You have to get p contracts that people sign. You know, all of the agreements that everybody on the on your production is going to sign, yes. and so forth. Now, in there's in development, you will have a legal budget in this, you know, quote unquote laundry list that we've been mentioning. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a line item for legal, and there's a lot of entertainment uh, attorneys out there in law firms that will package your legal. So, in other words, instead of giving you billable hours for a writer's agreement, instead of billable hours for your development investor agreement, uh, they will go, okay, here's the documents that you're most likely going to need. You're going to form a single-purpose entity or an LLC, limited liability company. You're going to have fees for that associated with doing the operating agreement, the articles of organization. You're going to have filing fees, all those things. And, you know, and I know this starts to sound sort of confusing and overwhelming, but Basically, you can get a package from any any decent attorney will package that so that you go, okay, look, I've got X number of dollars, but I need all these agreements done. If it goes over, that's on you. If you've already got most of the documents and you're just changing the preamble, then guess what? You made a bunch of money off me. But mm -hmm. you can generally limit how much money you're going to have to spend in development on legal. And you're correct. There are, de there are numerous legal documents that you need. You need to, even when you structure the LLC and if you bring in an investor, there are separate agreements to, are they passive? Do they have, are they managing members? Are they just members? So all of those things, legals are really, you know, under, underrated and overly important aspect of development because you have a liability factor. You have, you know, even the assignment of rights of your intellectual property to the single purpose entity or this limited liability company you have to transfer that document cleanly, have a chain of title, so that anybody who's financing that or a distributor can see that there's no encumbrances on that intellectual property. In other words, somebody's not going to jump out of the woodwork and go, hey, whoa, 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 I wrote that 10 years ago. That's my property. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things you have to consider. And legal, I'm really glad you brought that up because a lot of people just overlook it. But it is critical. Well, and I think I, my experience is that a lot of people who uh, go to – what they consider like a, the whole guerrilla film school notion it's the one of the things that everybody decides that they're going to skip is the whole there's two things they decide that they're going to skip um state employment law which is always a mistake cuz you know the state has seems to think people who are working on your set whether you're paying them or not are your employees um and if somebody gets hurt they really believe that and then the other thing that they feel strongly about is um if, if the legal aspect of actually having a corporation that that owns the intellectual property and also shields you in case uh, 
it creates it makes it so that people can sue the corporation without killing you, you know, without literally putting you out of yeah. business. You know. Yeah, and they, you know, it creates uh, the ways I've heard it expressed, or it creates an umbrella over you and all of the members within the within that mm -hmm. uh, LLC or limited liability company or corporation, however you form it. It puts a umbrella over that to protect you, but it also creates a veil, or which they refer to as mm -hmm. a corporate veil, which has to be pierced before anybody can go after you personally. In other words, mm -hmm. you have a property, something happens with that property, somebody gets injured on set, there's a intellectual property issue um, or a dispute, nobody can go after you and sue you personally. They can try, but they're going to need to get through that corporate veil first or that protection that you've created around yourself by forming a limited liability company to protect your intellectual property. Right, and the, and and that that corporation has to be run in a compliant way. That means you have to do all the things that it, that it requires you to do. Correct. It's not, it's not just filing. It's not just filing the papers at the state. There's like rules about how you run those kinds of organizations. And all of these things are. I think you mentioned one one of the things you mentioned to me is that a lot when you're first setting up a film company, all of these things seem very complex. So development and packaging, that's why so many filmmakers skip development and packaging and end up spending years funding their project. But in reality, you can move through the process relatively quickly as long as you know, as long as you, the checklist is important and also sure. having the team members, having the team members, the credible team members to do the, the development solves a lot of problems. Well, yeah, and you, you just said it. You can move through. It's not as horrible as it sounds. You can move through the development process pretty quickly, but also pretty painlessly as long as you approach it correctly, as long as you set things in. You know, and one of the things that our company does, um, we have a development division, and we will help clients put together, develop package. We'll do a budget, development budget for them. We'll let them make their own decision as to whether they have those elements or need those elements. And they can go ahead and seamlessly get through development so they can focus on what we all really want to focus on as filmmakers, which is the creativity. Uh, nobody wants to be a businessman or they would have taken business instead of gotten involved in film. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. But, yes, you can if you do that properly, if you package and develop properly. It's fairly seamless, and it moves through pretty quickly and painlessly if you do it right. Right. Did, so, and that so, sort of um, – and. So does it matter? I guess I have a couple of questions. The first one is: Does it? Um, is there an approximate cost? Or, like, let's say somebody said, "I spent, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars developing the developing and packaging my um, my two million dollar film." That would be crazy, or that would be normal? I, I well, look, there's people who do it all day long. I'm not one of them. I. I'm sort of, I, and possibly I'm just a cheapskate, but I sort of would like to spend as little as possible in development. I, I want to make sure I do everything, but there's no reason to spend absorbent fees in my mind. Um, I had a company that we were contracted with. They wound up spending 200000 in development, and we, you know, we kicked and screamed the whole way, telling them they were wasting money. But that's their prerogative. They had a $20 million film. They felt that it warranted it. It didn't. We could have gotten through doing just about everything they needed to do for about fifty thousand. Um, mm -hmm. Development to answer that question, it can be anywhere from thirty to one hundred thousand, depending on what elements are in place or what elements you need to put in place. And each project is completely different. Sometimes people want to shoot a trailer. Uh, I'm sort of on the fence about that. Sometimes I generally advocate don't. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I've seen a couple of cases where clients went, "Hey, I want to shoot a trailer," and they explained it to me, and I went, "You know." I think you should shoot a trailer. And that, of course, drives your development costs up because of the cost of production of the trailer. Um, we have a client right now that wants to do, because our company recently merged with uh, Platinum Studios, which did Cowboys and Aliens and Men in Black. So we have access to 1,300 comic properties. And so every time somebody goes on our website, they go, oh, my God, you guys do comics. And, well, we don't actually do comics. We you know, represent the 1,300 properties. But we do have access to the companies that hire artists, hire writers, letters, anchors, and put together graphic novels and comics. Mm -hmm. So we have a client right now who really wants a comic book element to their development, which in this case is, I think it's, you know, to me comic books are storyboards. And mm -hmm. I think that anything visual that you can create in development, mm -hmm. and there's some things we haven't discussed, like doing mock uh, poster art, uh, having social media presence and a website and development. Those are all real critical things that we can address later. But mm -hmm. visual media, you know, we're in a visual medium. 
and we're movie makers. So mm -hmm. I think that any kind of visual elements you can add to your development package are essential. You know, this particular client wants to make a comic book or a graphic novel version of their film, and we we actually, we absolutely advocate that in this case. Mm -hmm. Each one is different. So right. that having said that, that means that each budget is going to be completely different depending on its specific mm -hmm. requirements to get that developed. Right, and I and I think you know one of the things about graphic novels is you know they can um, a lot of times they sell. You know, the, these days you can publish a book in a matter of um, a book or an ebook in a matter of hours with no upfront cost through Amazon and through um, iBooks and so forth. So, and the revenue that you can earn, you know, you can earn like a dollar, two dollars, ten dollars um, on each sale. So it's another revenue stream. But it, you're right, there's a cost to doing that because you have to actually you have to create the property. So, Correct. but on the other hand, the movie can sell the property. So that becomes there's a lot of factors and. But and I think that also brings up the question of, it sounds like when you describe development and packaging, really it's you're de you're developing the whole business model for the film. You're developing, you're minimizing all of these risks, and you're figuring out what the what the projected um, revenues are going to be as long along with the projected costs, and you're figuring out the whole lifespan. You're, it's not sure. just getting well, into production. It's the whole that's a, that's next a, thing. That's a really Im important distinction. I think that's something that you know you and I have spoken about in the past. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, the, it, Sam Arkoff, who I encourage everybody out there to read his book called "Flying Through Hollywood by the Seat of My Pants." Um, Sam Arkoff formed uh, American International Pictures back in the 50s. He is the reason that we are independent filmmakers. He's the reason we can all work. Um, he created the independent film model. I won't go into detail with it now, but he said something really critical and important. He said the film business is 95% business and 5% film, and if more filmmakers understood that concept, they'd be substantially more successful. And mm -hmm. that's really important because people look at film as, oh, it's art, and I'm going to show people my vision, and that's fantastic, but it is a business. And I think, you know, Nancy, you're pointing out something really important. People need to approach film as a business model, mm -hmm. and that's what development is. Right. They need to. Well, I think. Well, I think a lot of times they feel like. Well, if I pay attention, if I look at the business aspects of it, you know, I can't. The, in uh, on an underlying level, they really, honest to God, don't believe that their underlying intellectual property is good enough. They think they'll. You know, they they're very proud of their work or whatever. But when it actually comes down to it, they don't think that they're. They don't think their project can withstand being looked at. They don't. They're afraid of showing their script to somebody to get the coverage, and they're afraid of what film independ uh, of what the film analytics company might say, and they're afraid of what the producer the producers, um, you know, the the UPM might say, and they're afraid of what the producers rep might say and the distributor might say. They're afraid all these people are going to say no, and they're not willing. They don't. They're so afraid that they don't even want to engage in the process, and they don't realize that the, the hammering that they do on the project makes it stronger. It's like tempering steel. You take a good script, and you, you take a good script, you put it in through the process, and there's going to be little changes and adjustments and insights that happen, and you end up with something that's actually strong, as opposed to just something that gets, you know, like the million other films that never go anywhere. If you were in, you know, that's, there's a point to that, and that's a really, that's a really good analogy. There's a point to that. You need to be open to those changes. You know, as a writer, which is how I started out in this industry, I used to look at my, you know, I coveted my work, and people would go, oh, you should do this, and I would have a lot of four-letter expletives to give them my opinion of what I thought of them wanting to change my script. But then I realized over time, and as I became a producer and had moved on to doing other things in film, I realized that filmmaking is a collaborative effort. It's not, if you want it to be a single thing, go be a novelist. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a collaborative effort. It takes, you know, they, the old expression, it takes a village. And it does. In this case, you need to be open-minded to those changes with people who have more experience, regardless of what you personally think. And the analogy that I always give it as a writer, I wrote a script, and a lot of people contributed to that work. And at the end of the day, I got paid, and I got credit for that script. They didn't. Um, so anything that makes it better, you're going to get the credit for it anyway, so you should probably be pretty right. open to that concept. Right, and I also think another thing, it's not always the case that other people's ideas, they tend to grow on you. Sometimes they'll say, well, you know, like you may have an idea for casting, and then the people that, that uh, you work with on casting show you 15 different other ideas you never thought of. And then all, the, and especially if you meet, you know, you really sit there and you go, my God, that's so much better. Or you won't even realize what you could have gotten. 
So there's like Absolutely. sometimes the, sometimes the sometimes the surprises are actually extremely pleasant. I think I don't know. It's my, I, they, I'm shocked at how much I like it. They are, and you know sometimes people just have stupid ideas, but that mm-hmm. goes with everything. Um, but no, I think that's you know people do really contribute. I think one of the scripts that just got financed from our company that I wrote. Um, it's so much better for having 30, 40 people and their input on it. Um, I will say this before we close that out, because you said something earlier when mm-hmm. you were talking about sort of forging you know, your project. Um, mm-hmm. If you're going to be a filmmaker, you can't be afraid of no. You can't be afraid of somebody criticizing your work. You've got to look at yourself as a pilgrim coming across on the Mayflower. Mm-hmm. And there's a bunch of people who wanted to go on the Mayflower, and there's a bunch of people that went, eh, that's not my thing. And there are people who got on the Mayflower, and they endured many hardships, which you will endure as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. But they got to a new land, and they fulfilled their dreams. And I think if you're going to be a filmmaker, picture yourself on the Mayflower. It Mm -hmm. is not for the faint of heart. You have Mm -hmm. to be fearless. And you really have to be fearless in order to make a film. Yeah, I think, and I also think you have to see things, uh, too many film. I think a lot of filmmakers are just, Again, it comes back to being fearful. They honestly believe this is going to be their only film. So they do crazy things. And you're like, you know, you could have two films or three films if you would, like, not do something stupid. You know, in other words, maybe you should think in terms of a career, you know, as if you might be allowed to do what you love for a living. So given that you're here for the long haul, how about you just pick up the skills you need to be successful, you know, in the long haul? (laughs) You know, and and I think that's a huge thing. You're, you're right, and that goes back to what you've been advocating, which is it's a business. You know, you have to treat it as a business. You mm-hmm. have to be fearless. You have to be smart. You have to make the right decisions, but you really do need to be fearless. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even when you get to the development stage, we have a lot of clients who I work with uh, Michael Praver's company who mm-hmm. can get funding for – he can get mm-hmm. development funding fairly mm-hmm. easily for a lot mm-hmm. of clients. Um mm-hmm. We go back and forth, we recommend clients to each other, and I can't tell you how many times we've had clients get all the way down to the starting point of the race, mm-hmm. and then they go, whoa, 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 wait, I'm responsible for that development funding? Well, yeah. Well, they don't, what, the, what they don't understand is they're also, you know, a, a lot of people don't understand they're responsible for the production of the film. I mean, that's been... Well, and, sure, sure. I mean, how many, they, times have, how many times have you actually, you just look at them and you go, you know, if somebody gets hurt on your set, it's your... It's your thing. You understand that, right? If somebody gets injured on your set, it's but that's, your set. I think set. that's abstract for people. I don't think people, it's they true. go, yeah, 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 they get hurt, I'll deal with it then. But I think, you know, when it comes mm-hmm. down right to this, you know, you're at the starting gate, ready to fire that thing open. And, mm-hmm. you know, Michael and I have both had clients that, you know, they, we get right there and we go, okay, you qualify for funding, we can get you funding, we can get you developed, we can get you, you know, all the way down the road and get you to capital funding and get your film made. And they go, oh, wait. I'm responsible for that development funding. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times we've heard that, and you just sort of shake your head and you go, well, sure you are, but it's your film. That's where the fearlessness comes in, but that's also where the sort of business approach comes in. You've got to make sure that what you're doing with that money mm-hmm. is responsible, because if you were to take somebody else's money, then that's okay if you lose it. Yes. I that's don't ex- understand that. Yeah. That's a key thought, and it's and it's funny thing because I've actually had I, I, I'm like you I've had a million people. It's like well I need money I need funding in order to do development or I need funding in order to do you know a hundred different things and you're like and or or you'll ask them questions about their business. Well you know let's say that somebody gives you X amount of money how are you going to handle this risk or did it are you sure this is true this thing that you said about being able to get this rebate I mean if you have you confirmed that that it's possible that you're approved to get this rebate based upon this budget or whatever and they'll be like well I don't know for sure and you're like okay well it's interesting because you're going to make people give you money and you're not really protecting their interests very well and when you have investors it's not the case that you burn them they don't die after you like after you they sign a contract with you they don't die so you're going to be working with them. It's a relationship. A relationship with your investors is a relationship that goes on, you know, for the life of the project. So, and if you want to do a second film and a third film, they need to like you. Well, and, you know, <laughs> you just can't go around burning everybody. <laughs> no, you can't burn people. But I will tell you this, and you mm-hmm. know, I've had a lot of filmmakers that are friends of mine that you mm-hmm. sort of shake your head at their stupidity. I've mm-hmm. had friends that have gotten other people's money. And they don't make it back. And you find out they never packaged and developed correctly. They didn't get distribution. They didn't do analytics. They didn't find out what their market was. Right. And those investors, you're correct, the investors don't die. But when they sue you, they make you wish you were dead. 
That's true. And so, and I think that's another reason to do good development is because if you're serious about making a film, you're actually building a business plan. You're building a, not, a business model and a business plan, and the objective is for you to be able to do what you love for the rest of your life. So it's worth – you're allowed to actually invest – the time it takes to do a, to do the responsible development, and I think that um, again, I, I sometimes get down on the two day film schools, um, and I really probably shouldn't because I think they do introduce a lot of people to the industry. But one of the things that they, whenever you read through the books that talk about the two day film school, they they entirely skip development. It's all about well, get it, here's how you get the money for your film, and here's how you shoot on a budget, and here's how you here's how you can shoot guerrilla style without getting caught, um, you know, on a on a Los Angeles public street or da da da. And it's like you know, here's the thing: all of those shortcuts that you're taking are, are, have correlated risks that you're taking as well, and those risks can be higher than those risks can be higher than expected. And I and I think that's particularly true when it comes to the health and the safety. And the reputation of your cast and your crew, and when oh, it comes sure. to, and when it comes to you actually having content that you can e- legally distribute, like if you decided to skip that whole rights clearing thing, yep, so you have a, you, you you say that you you've got a piece of paper that sa- that you signed that sa- that says it's an option agreement or it's a uh, you purchased a, you've licensed a script or you've purchased a script, okay? Well, then you produce the film and it turns out that those rights haven't been cleared. That's a that's a bit of a problem because your film can't be distributed legally. Yeah, and there's those those things have happened, and I think you know that's why we go back to things like the insurance. Um, and mm-hmm. you know when you get your film made, you get something called E and O insurance, which is errors and omissions insurance. And mm-hmm. that's in case you know, and they do clearance reports and all those things ahead of time so they protect themselves. Mm-hmm. But assuming you've gotten to that point and you actually were diligent about getting all that clearance, you have to have insurance on that because somebody's going to come back and say, hey, you had a character named Bob Smith, and that's my name, and you made him look like a complete dick, mm-hmm. and they'll sue you for it. And I, I've actually seen those cases. I sat in on a couple of mediation cases for that, and you just shake your head at how ridiculous it is. But it goes back to be responsible. Be responsible to your investors. Be mm-hmm. responsible with your crew and your cast. Be responsible with your production. And as a producer, that is your job is to take responsibility at the end of the day you know, you're the guy that you don't get to pass the buck, or the girl, sorry. Right. Um, but you're the person who has to take responsibility. And if you're not willing to take responsibility, if you're not fearless, if you don't have a good business sense, then you really have no business making a film. Right. I mean, you'll be sorry, and it, it can be extremely – it can be something that turns into a 10, 20, a 10 or 20-year hassle for you. I mean, it's a, a true setback. So – and I think um, – I think – the it's probably a good time for us to to um introduce michael just for a few minutes cuz uh, and um um one of the reasons that um so you and michael started working together and uh, and if you want to take just a few uh, a moment or two to specifically um address the problem that michael solves um that would be helpful oh sure um i can sure i can do that michael i'll sort of step in on you here <laughs> sure um <laughs> Michael's actually been, you know, we've developed and packaged for years, mostly our own projects, but recently in, you know, the last few years we started developing for other clients. And the big issue was we do development, we go, okay, look, it's 40000 it's 60000 whatever the development budget is, and 99% of the people don't have a rich uncle. Um, I don't, so I don't know about that 1%, but most people, they will, I don't have $50,000, and few of us do. And so what Michael does, he has a, and I'll let you, Michael, sort of go into the details of it, but he has a, he's a finance facilitator in the sense that he can find you uh, financing lines of credit, uh, money that you can access so that you can develop and package your project. And if you're smart with it, you can leverage that money to getting you to capital funding. And you can get that money reimbursed out of the production budget because there's a line item to reimburse all development expenses. I won't go too much into what Michael does specifically. I'll let him cover that. But he's been extremely influential and helpful to our clients in getting them development funding so that we can get them through the development process and into production. So, And one more thing before we we step off this particular topic. So let's say somebody goes through the whole development process. Is it 100% guaranteed that they'll be able to get capital funding? Have you ever seen it be the case that somebody goes through great development and cannot, no matter what they do, get capital funding? That, that's a fantastic question, and that comes down to there is 
no guarantee whatsoever in the film industry. And I think if you're going to be a responsible filmmaker, you need to tell investors and everybody you deal with, there are no guarantees. You can substantially mitigate your risk, but if it was that easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, mm -hmm. It can be done. You have to be responsible with it. There is no 100% guarantee, but there is a way to protect your investment, especially your development investment. And, you know, we tell clients, look, if you go on the hook for fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, the worst case scenario, and you better take it as a reality, is that you're going to be making payments on those lines of credit for the next couple of years. That's the way it goes. That's part mm -hmm. of the risk of filmmaking. But if you're smart, you'll get it funded. And even if you don't get it funded, there are things, a process, and this is a whole separate conversation. Um, I encourage anybody listening to look up what's referred to as turnaround in the industry. Uh, Film Profit did a really uh, notable turnaround study. And basically, turnaround is where you package and develop, do all the things we've been discussing for the last 51 minutes, and you put it all together and you go, you know, I just can't pull the trigger. I don't have the connections. I've been turned down for financing. Those people that you hired in development, your producer's rep, your attorney, they can actually take your project to companies like Fox Searchlight. There's a ton of these production companies that buy up package projects with talent attached, intellectual properties already uh, taken care of. You've got all the elements in place. You've got distribution in place. And they will pay you for that package developed project. Generally, they'll pay you what you have into it in a percentage and then some back-end percentage that you'll never see. But if you have an investor that put up that 60000 mm -hmm. and it's been a year and they're starting to get a little twitchy, you can mm -hmm. always look into the options to turn around to protect that investor's investment so that you can actually go back to the well next time and say, hey, look, it didn't work, but I got your money back. Right. Or and if you're the person or if you're the project. person or if you're the person who's sure. who's who's funded it for however you funded it. You know, $60,000 is like the price of an expensive car. But um if you've decided to um fund make the funding um available to yourself, then you can look around look around for other options. But uh, the reason there I'm asking that There are other options. That, right. I want yes. to make sure about that. So so the problem just to review the problem that Michael solved for you is or not solved for you um is he made it easier. You finally had somebody you could send people to when they had brought you a project and they wanted to do um, funding, but they didn't have any way, they didn't have an investor to, to put up the money f the, for the development costs. And so you finally had somebody you could turn, you could, you could send people to and say, look, contact this guy um, who, who um, has a solution, you know, can help you figure out how to get the um, business finance you need to be able to do, to finance. And he development. has, his company has a reasonable and viable solution. Um, you know, I don't get paid by him, so I don't have to really sell him, but he's been extremely helpful to a lot of our clients. He's, you know, Michael has single-handedly gotten, I can't even tell you how many clients' development funding who have gone on to get capital funding. Um, mm -hmm. It's a, And again, anytime you're dealing with funding, anytime you're dealing with film, again, there is no guarantees. But if you're not fearless, if you're not responsible, then you shouldn't be making films as creative yeah, as you want to be. Well, it's kind of like being a, actually. I work. My husband works in the startup land. God, you want to talk about bizarre? They're just he's does tech, tech startups, and I see things go by. You just would go. If you think film's crazy business, you got to hang out with the techs. So let's talk for a minute. Sure. To, let's talk for a second to Michael. So Michael, um, do you want to spend a few minutes? I think people need to understand sort of where you actually, where you actually came from, because I I think you're one of unusual in the film industry, um, and it's one of the reasons that you've been able to fulfill. This very this this particular niche in the marketplace. Um, so, do you want to talk sort of about your background in in uh, business finance and in um, building your company, building the your the customers that you work with over a period of years, like building their credit their finance over a period of years? Sure, we're. We're really in business finance and startup business finance, and we had nothing to do with film. We actually didn't know anything about film, and I luckily, by accident, at a barbecue, met a guy whose name is Ray Ellingson, <laughs> and Ray is the one who taught me uh, what development was in the first place. So we're really just doing the same startup business techniques that we've been doing for 10 years now. I think it's 10 years next month, um, but we're applying it to film. So I knew nothing about film. Ray explained what development was. He sent me a client. 
I funded them and sent them back to Ray. He sent me a second client and a third. He sent me a dozen clients, and at that point, I committed myself to doing this much more seriously, and I've been going to film events every every since almost every single day. And in fact, I'm now speaking at a lot of them. I was speaking at one at the Egyptian Theater earlier today on film finance. So we're building businesses. If you choose to use that money and that guidance towards opening up your production company or calling yourself a production call your company, mm -hmm. that's great. And if you want to then use that money towards development, I mean, that's terrific for a lot of reasons. One is that normally, at least in Ray's model, as capital funding comes in, development funding comes back out to you, which you could then maybe use to fund the development of your next film, even though you haven't made your first one yet. So mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful connection, and the fact that development often costs around 60000 and we are our, our very basic startup program is usually fifty to 200 so it's just a, a perfect match with the size mm -hmm. of, of a development budget and what we can do with a startup company. Right. The other, another, another thing that um, I – I've met because because I've been running events for a long time and I've met um, your customers from time to time, um, and I've because I've um, worked with you um, in the past. You one of the things that you've mentioned is that you sort of have a long term approach to you see this you see filmmakers come to you or and all not just filmmakers but other people you do you do a lot of different kinds of funding but for a lot of different kinds of customers. But when you're working with filmmakers, a lot of times people come to you and they're really thinking about the current project. And you're very clear on the fact that your objective is to fund production companies or to fund companies, and also not just to do it once, but to do it over a period, to grow it over a period of time. So it's not, so it, your objective is not just, it's not a short-term objective. Your expectation is that you're going to be working with people, not just this year, but next year and the year after and the year after that, growing, like helping them grow their their ability to manage business business credit. I mean, because they yeah. need to be able to do that in order to handle cash flow problems as their company grows. It's one thing, you know, you can operate out of a shoebox for your first film, by the second film or third film, but the more projects that you get going and the more work you do, the more likely it is that you're going to need to be able to, to handle a problem that, you know, you're going to have to handle a cash flow problem. You know, you're getting paid... Sure. So those are the kinds of things that you also do. Is, correct, is that correct? You sort of have a long-term Yeah, it's focus. just a long-term approach. Every single thing we do beyond the first funding is geared to the ability to grow that client further and further and further. We take them from program to program or within the same program we start them with, and we grow them. So there's no commitment. It's not a long-term agreement, but our approach is we want to help you. We want to grow you. You don't want to make a film. You want to be a filmmaker. So next year you're making your second film, and the year after that, maybe you have enough funding that you're investing in someone else's film and making your third film. It's all about growth to us. So every filmmaker comes to us to fund their individual film, and we do our best to get them into the mindset and also financially put them in a position to grow a business and think about themselves as a business and not as a one-time filmmaker. Yes. Right. And the other thing that I think you've mentioned um, is that uh, you talked about the um, the fact that a lot of filmmakers that you meet, even ones who have previously produced films, they often have got crazy things going on, like they've they've got personal credit and business credit, and they've gotten to the point where they're, they're generating enough revenue to have to have establish some kind of business finance separate from their personal finance, which they need so they can do things like buy a house because they can't there's some, everything's showing up on their personal credit or they've reached a point where they need to want to purchase a facility or a location or they want to purchase a studio or they've decided that you know it makes sense for them to actually own an editing and uh, do editing like have a uh, post production facility sure. and so you start thinking Our so you can actually talk to them about how to how to achieve those objectives. Yeah, our smallest program is fifty to two hundred thousand. Our largest program is one to five million, and we do many things in between to kind of guide people and transition them from program to program. So yes, 
we, our absolute goal is to grow you, be it within your program or within moving from program to program. So yeah, our goal is the same. It's to grow you as a company, as an individual, and to achieve your goals. Right, and and when you talk about the five one to five million dollar program, that's an that's an SBA that's a SBA based um, like for, you can do an SBA loan, which is one of the you're the yes. only one I know who knows how to do SBA loans. Nobody else <laughs> can make those people give them money. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's our specialty. I mean, it's 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 what we 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 it's the most inexpensive thing we can do. We're actually doing one. I can't name the name of the company until they're done, but there's a post-production house right now in uh, Universal City that can't buy the building they're in, so they're looking for a $2.5 million building to buy to move their post-production house into, and then within the next year, I'm sure they're going to go either expand or buy another similar company, and that's all through the SBA. You can buy a company, buy a building, grow your business. You just can't start a business with the SBA. You can buy a business, you can't start one. They don't do startup. Okay. So, so yeah, we we'll, we'd love to help anyone who's interested. I'm sure uh you know, Nancy could mm -hmm. could uh will have our our information I'm sure on her website. Yes, uh both mine and Ray's and mm -hmm. you know, anything I can do to help any filmmaker, I would love to help either individually or as groups. I've got now production companies that have brought me as many as 10 partners simultaneously. We even do little calls like we're having now, but just within one company. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna, we have actually got a bunch of questions we should actually click through. Go ahead. And then if, if anybody does have a question, they should send an email to nancy.fulton at yahoo.com. That's N-A-N-C-Y dot F-U-L. T O N at yahoo dot com. The other thing is, I want to make sure that people know how to find you guys. Um, the first one is Michael, uh, sorry, Ray Ellingson, E L L I. <laughs> you have a hard name, Ray Ellingson, E L L I N G S E N, right? Correct. And you can find him at. Um, uh, it's moving moving pictures media group dot com. Right. And then uh, Michael Praver is at filmfundingla.com. So you can find both of these guys. You can reach out directly to them, and you can mention that you're on the call and that if you have additional questions you want to get answered. So let me go ahead and take the first question, which is um, I think, <laughs> one of, I think uh, the first question we have, which I think we've answered in exhaustive detail, is what are the big mistakes that amateurs make? And I think um, I, I think – Ray has reviewed the fact that it's um, the fact that they don't actually treat their business like a business, and they don't they decide that losing somebody else's money would be just fine, but they don't want to actually um, think rational, be, rationally about building a company that can actually make money. Which means that they they skip development, they skip packaging, they wander around looking for money all the time, and on the off chance they get money, they do crazy things with it. Is that sort of correct or? Would you that's uh, that's it a pretty good. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty good abridged version of that. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think you know it, it comes down to what are the biggest mistakes. I think if you don't treat it as a business, that's your biggest mistake. And I think if you don't know how to create a business, then you reach out to people who have the experience and you work directly with them to create the business correctly. Great. Okay. So. Um all right, this is a question I'm not sure that we can answer, um, and but I, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. So someone is producing a, um independent motion picture that's a superhero movie, and it has special, uh, visual effects. And how do how can somebody how – how does a line producer come up with a, a budget for how much the visual effects are going to cost? Is, 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 you know. That's easy. That's, that's okay. actually a pretty simple question. Um, there's a lot of companies. I'm just going to use one because I've dealt with them extensively. There's a company out there, Digital Domain. There's, I think there's something like 46 visual effects companies in Los Angeles proper. And then there's tons in other states and all over the world. Uh, Korea is getting a huge uh, share of that marketplace, as is China um, and India, believe it or not. But to go back to the question, how do you figure it out? Now, when you're doing a budget, again, it's the day out of days, which is the breakdown uh, or a schedule and you're figuring out your, as I mentioned, your burn rate per day. In that day out of day schedule, you have schedules attached to that day out of days, which one is a visual effects schedule, one is a location schedule, one is a cast schedule. 
Um, those are just separate little uh, items that are prepared by your AD. Um, and you'll take that visual effects schedule, and it'll have a bullet point of every visual effect, like scene 27, you know, scene 27, um, hero punches the bad guy, bad guy flies a mile away. Um, you know, two planes crash in midair. Those are pretty much visual effects unless you, well, never mind. <laughs> um, so, I don't know where you're going um, with that, man. <laughs> yeah, those might go there. So uh, those are visual effects. And so you have those bullet point effects, and you will send those over to somebody, uh, you know, like Digital Domain, one of these visual effects companies, and you'll get a quote. Now, this is what your line producer should be doing, not you, because the line producer probably already has relationships with them um, or the UPM. And they'll give you a quote of a breakdown of, hey, if you want just uh, you know, basic animatics to see what it'll look like, that's one cost. If you want full 3D rendering visual effects, if you want landscape effects, uh, full motion capture effects at 4K, at 6K um, resolution, those are all things they'll give you a quote for. And then you can go back and, and uh, say, all right, well, I, l I love the idea of two planes crashing in midair and you know, huge fireball and all this stuff, but really we only have the budget to have this guy Bob here get on a bicycle. He'll go up to the top <laughs> of the hill, pull down, and hit a brick wall. You've got metal parts flying, blood, same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is there's a lot of difference. But to answer this question, um, you would have in your schedule and your budget, which you're going to do properly because you're treating this like a business, and you'll have professionals do that for you. Um, they will go contact directly the visual effects house. They'll get a quote. That will come back and, and you will uh, input that as a line item to your budget. Very cool. Um, so the next question is kind of an interesting one. It's more candid than I'm used to. What if I don't know if my script's good enough? So oh, d is it the case like can they bring people? Can they bring you a project and say, I don't know, like this is the script screenplay that I want to do. And can you take? Can you figure out how? How do you determine if your scripts aren't good enough, or what do you do if they're not good enough? Well, that's that's actually really kind of an interesting question. Um, it's you know, and everything's subjective. Art is subjective. You know, people can look at a piece of art and go, "Ew," and other people are just captivated by it. So your script being quote unquote good enough is subjective. However, there's companies like Script Services. There's all these companies that will do coverage, and coverage is simply an analysis of your script by a third party who's, you know, got limited imagination for the most part, um, <laughs> which is what you want. Um, and they will break down your script as far as, you know, everything from how many pages, what the cast members are, the storyline, the story arc, whether it's marketable, where the weaknesses in the characters are, where the strengths of the characters are. They're not going to tell you you have a crappy script, but they will give you coverage and they will give you, in some cases, a uh, rating. Uh, if you're bold, ask for the rating. If you don't want to be, you know, have your feelings hurt and crushed into the ground, have them delete that rating from your script coverage, um, unless you're really confident. Uh, but I actually ask for the rating anyway because it gives you an idea of what you're up against. You can, it's, you can spend anywhere from $200 to $800 on coverage. You shouldn't spend $800 unless you're getting some really extensive coverage done uh, that's very germane and specific to what you're doing. But uh, for a couple hundred dollars, you can send it out. Uh, companies like ours, and, and there's other companies. There's uh, Ingram Studios. There's a lot of companies like my company out there. And I recommend people to them all the time because we work with them eventually anyway. But um, there's other companies you can go to. And most companies, if somebody brings a script to us and they say, hey, we'd like to develop and package, we do internal coverage. Uh, we hire somebody. We pay them ourselves. We do not charge a fee for that. And in some cases, we come back and give the client their coverage and say, hey, look, your project needs work. I would suggest you bring in a second writer, or we can find a writer for you, a script doctor, to help you fix these elements that have issues. Um, does Correct. a writer get a credit, or is a writer like a ghost writer? Uh, there's two ways you can do that. If, uh, in this case, this uh, filmmaker wants to be WGA or Writers Guild of America, uh, mm -hmm. He wants to join the guild, so uh, we're doing a signatory picture for him. And because the contribution by this other writer was substantial, they're going to get writing credit in accordance with the WGA standards, and they'll also get paid a portion of the uh, writer's fee in production, which this guy, is, he's pretty happy with at this point. Um, okay. I so just yes, wondered. Uh, 
Yeah, and there is a line item for bringing on that script doctor. In some cases, you can just bring on a silent writer. In some cases, you get an accredited writer, and it's actually going to help you to have their name attached to your project. So it's all mm. negotiable. That's really, that's really an interesting insight. Or are you saying that, it, that somehow it helps his credibility to be on the page with another accredited writer? Is that the way it works? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Absolutely. And sometimes I understand that accredited that. writer really it diminishes their uh, writing credentials as well. So it's a mm -hmm. two-way street. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. yeah, again, those are all negotiable factors. That right. isn't a, that's a that's a really interesting insight. So, because it means that that um, you've got the maximum assurance that the project your project is actually going to go from um, screen from script to solid script all the way to the development process with, some, with something that's commercially viable, as opposed to as opposed to I have a friend who says, well, you know, you, you can't polish a turd. So it does you know, I, and I think there, there's a, a risk if it, if you don't make sure that the underlying intellectual property is really solid, and if there's no way to fix the broken intellectual property at the script level, then it doesn't matter how much the de how good the development is. But if there's a solution, if you if you have a solution for making it so the, s the script fixes are done, then that's that means well, that you're developing a much stronger piece. You guarantee sure, you can I'm, do a lot to I'm, guarantee that you've got a solid project. Well, again, there's no guarantees, but you can substantially mitigate or minimize your risks. Um, and if I'm stuck mm -hmm. with your analogy of polishing a mm -hmm. turd. I apologize. Um, no, 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 that's fine. Um, I think, you know, those can be turned into fertilizer, which, you know, does have a lot of uses. That's it, true. It all depends. It all depends on, and look, whoever asked this question, if you're listening, um, what if my script's not good enough? Well, you know, look, every again, ideas are subjective and creativity mm -hmm. subjective. But I think that if you get enough people, and, and we discussed this earlier in this conference, mm -hmm. if you get enough people and enough input, you can turn something that has just the, the gem or kernel mm -hmm. of something good in it, and you can, you can make that bloom into something pretty substantial and pretty interesting. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. be discouraged as a writer of, oh, what if it's not good enough? Because there are solutions. You know, just about any idea can be marketable if it's mm -hmm. properly developed. Right, and I, I, I guess we should we should tie up. What I want to do is, um, I just uh, fired you and uh, you and Michael off a question that we got that's more, too involved for us to address. I think on the phone, it's it's a multi-part question. But um, oh, I have I have one, Nancy. Um, okay. Ray, earlier today I was speaking at some uh, the Latin filmmakers at the Egyptian theater, and. Um, I received this question, but I wanted you to answer it for, for the folks that are listening. Um, they were kind of complaining about the fact that they, everyone was looking for some directors that had experience, but they couldn't get experience because they couldn't get jobs in the first place. And so basically it was a first-time director question. Can you address that one? I am addressing it right now with another client, actually, uh, a client that you're helping. Um, they have a first-time director. They have a I, – I mean, this is possibly one of the best scripts I've seen in five years, and I'm not – that is no exaggeration. They have a brilliant project. Um, it's meaningful. It's, they have, you know, sort of some good social media behind it. Um, it's a really well thought out project, and the writer wants to direct, and he's a first time director, and his biggest fear is he's been told, oh, no, no, you can't do a project like this as a first time director. I, I think that's crap. Um, we, our company has supported more first time directors than I can count. And you don't, all you need to do from a finance standpoint and from a distribution standpoint is surround yourself or insulate yourself as a first time director with all the necessary elements to protect that investment. You're going to, if you can get a completion bond, and a completion bond doesn't care if you're a first-time director, and they will care, but if you get a good DP or director of photography, if you get a good line producer, if you get a good AD, who all have experience and have been bondable, and the completion bond company looks at that and says, well, you know, we're comfortable. I've seen it happen more times than not, and how do you get your first experience if nobody's going to believe in you? So my, my short answer to that is, if you're a first-time director, do not be discouraged by it. Just make sure you surround yourself with all of the critical elements and experience you need so that everybody else from the finance, from distribution, from insurance will buy into that and go, well, we have enough elements that are secure that we're going to go ahead and take the chance. 
So I think um, we should probably call it an evening, gentlemen. Does that sound true? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Great job. And Thank Ray. you very much. Terrific. Thank you so much, Ray. It was amazing, Ray. It was wonderful to hear you speak. And it, uh, <laughs> you're such a nice person. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It's, you I, describe I'm things so speak. nicely. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I hope you have an excellent evening. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.